Hey guys, thanks for uh, joining up the night before a big storm's coming in. Uh, looks like it's eight o'clock, so we'll get started. Um, so yeah, welcome back. To, we're starting session three today, which will be talking about tools and equipment. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, feel free to type them in the chat, and I have a uh, I have a window open so I can I can see um, any chats that come in. All right, so the first is going to be a list of the essential tools, and I have a couple images. Sorry about some of the images. It's tough to find royalty-free images out there that I can uh, that I can use without having to pay for them. So I use what I can find. Um, but the list of the essential tools, the first is going to be a bee brush, which is just a, a little brush that you can use to um, get bees off of the comb. So you know, if you're looking for eggs or larvae and um, it, the frame is just covered with bees, you can use a, a, a bee brush and just brush them off and into the hive. Um, next tool you're gonna wanna have is a hive tool, which is the, the picture on the right. There's several different kinds of hive tools. Um, I have uh, one of each on each of the ends. So I have the one with the little J hook, which is good for um, uh, prying up the frames. You know, if the bees propolize the, the, the frames to the box itself, um, that's a nice easy way to, to pry it up and I also have the one on the other end because I didn't know which one I was going to like when I first started so I got one of each I use them both you know inevitably you you know in the middle of a hive inspection you misplace one and it's nice to have a have an extra they're only five or six bucks each so um, that, that would be what I would recommend get one of each see which one you like better um, but uh, but yeah and, and there's several different um, kinds that you know they they all do the same same idea they basically just help you get the frames out of the hives or help you separate the boxes when they glue them together with the with the propolis next thing you're going to need is a smoker the uh, smoker helps to uh, calm the bees a little bit and also diffuses any um, um, you know, alert pheromones that might uh, be put out you know if someone's getting into the hive uh, Bees, uh, honeybees are not aggressive, uh, but they are defensive. So when you're going through the hive, um, and if you're not being slow, methodical, um, when you're doing your movements, um, they can uh, come up and, and bite you. Uh, not really bite you, they sting you, but you know, they, we say that they bite you. Um, so the smoker can help diffuse some of that, uh, the pheromone of, hey, you know, we, we need to do something. Uh, it also calms them a little bit because um, they say that they will perceive that there's a forest fire and they'll start, they'll go down and um, gorge themselves on honey, thinking that the hive might have to leave and, and relocate. Um, so it also keeps them preoccupied uh, while you're in there doing your inspection. Uh, next thing you're going to want is some sort of um, protective veil or jacket. And really, that's up to your comfort level. Um, when I started, I got the jacket. They have the full body suits as well. And if you're more comfortable in that, then you know certainly go that, that way. Um, I myself, I started with the jacket, um, which had the, the veil attached to it. Um, and th that worked out fine for me. I, I was happy with that. Right now, I only use a, a veil because it's it's hot in the summer, and um, you know if you're spending a you know a significant amount of time in the in the hives during the heat, um, it can get pretty warm. Uh, next thing you don't want is is gloves, um, and I certainly recommend gloves for starting. Um, um, it just it, it gives you the peace of mind to know you know if you have a bee walking on your hand, you don't have to. Um, get excited or distracted or, 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 uh, or freak out or anything. Um, sugar and pollen patties, it's not really a tool, but it's something you're going to, you're going to want to have on hand um, and some kind of feeder. Oops, did I do that? Yeah. Um, so some sort of a, a feeder and we'll go into the variety of feeders that there are out there. Okay. Um, there's also some optional tools that you know you don't necessarily need, but um, could be good to have. Um, there's a, a ton of different tools out there that are you know more gimmicky than anything, and so you know I would say when you're starting out, start with the essentials, and then 
you know, if you say, oh, hey, you know, it might be nice to have uh, something that will help me grab the frame um, or a, a cage to hold the queen. Um, you know, 99% of the time, you're not going to need to to separate the queen from the hive for any reason. But if you do, it's nice to have a, a cage um, that um, it has the slots in it so that worker bees can still feed her, but um, but she's too big to get through the uh, through the gaps. Um, and the last one I didn't have a picture of is a frame rest. So when you're going through the hive and if you take a, a frame out of the hive, instead of resting it on the ground or resting it next to the, uh, to the hive itself, that's basically a bar that um, hangs on the edge of the box that you can hang um, a frame or two on um, while you're going through the rest of the hive. Um, so these are, you know, not essential, optional, um, but, you know, you, you might find that you want them. Um, I put this one in here because, you know, everybody's like, oh, are you, uh, you know, they think it's, you're, uh, you're a big deal if you go into your hive without using any, uh, any protection and especially all over YouTube, you know, you don't see a lot of people using, uh, protection. Um, th there's no need to be a hero. Uh, this is a picture of a glove that has probably a couple dozen, uh, stings. Uh, to it and if, if that was your ungloved hand it, it would probably hurt i'm not sure this wasn't my uh, uh my picture so i'm not sure what led to, led up to that but you know sometimes if you you know accidentally drop a frame the bees aren't going to be very happy with you um so uh, certainly i would say use protective protective gear for your first season um get a feel for it get your comfort level um your comfort level will increase over time but it's important that when you're in the hive you're not worried about am i going to get stung or there's a bee crawling on my arm you want to be focused on all right do i see a queen do i see eggs larvae is there any you know sign of uh, disease in the hive um, those are the things you really want to be focusing on um, and, and not you know am i going to get stung or um, you know is, is it, so so first year i would say have some sort of um, protection even if it's just a a, a veil and gloves that will certainly get you uh, get you going. So the most common type of hive is uh, is called the Langstroth hive, and this is a, a picture of one here. Um, um, they uh, there's several different components to it, and all hives are going to have um, generally um, similar functions, uh, but just different. Um, different shapes. So for the length drop, the, the first thing is the landing board. Um, it's just a, a board at a 45 degree angle. When the bees are coming into the hive, give them a place to land and then they can walk up and crawl into the, um, uh, into the hive with their nectar, pollen, what have you. The next is the bottom board, which sits on top of the landing board, and that's going to be the um, the floor of the hive. There's a couple different types of bottom boards. There's solid bottom board, which is just solid wood all the way um, all the way across the bottom, and then there's a screened bottom board, which provides uh, ventilation and um, it's um, can allow mites to fall through um, through the bottom. Um, so they're not catching a ride back into the hive if they are, are groomed off of a bee. Um, I, I do, I use both. I haven't noticed a significant difference in each, but, you know, I, I, I like to experiment. And so I do one of each. And, um, you know, the, the ventilation is nice for the, the screen bottom. But I think in the winter, it's nice to have the, the solid bottom to help retain a little bit of the heat in there. The next two are called deep hive bodies. Um, these are where the queen is going to be laying her eggs. Um, the brood is going to be raised. That's where all of the, that's basically going to be the the house of the hive, um, the, the house for the bees. So that's where all the work's going to be. Uh, New England, you use two deep hive bodies. That usually gives you enough um, space to have a, a large enough cluster to make it through winter. Um, one alternative is to use three of the medium, the smaller size boxes, um, similar, similar function, um, but just a, a different way to do it. Sometimes the deep hive bodies, uh, can get heavy if they start getting full of honey. And so if you're 
uh, weaker, older, don't want to be lifting heavy things, have a bad back. Sometimes the three deep versus uh, two medium, uh, I'm sorry, three medium instead of the two deeps um, can be a way to go. Um, I prefer the two deeps because I like only having to look through 20 hives at a time or 20 frames at a time instead of 30 because you have an extra 10 frames um, if, if you have, uh, have the three mediums. Um, another option, they also make eight frame, which is a little bit more narrow. Um, same idea, just you know, lighten the weight a little bit, but you have two fewer frames. Next is the queen excluder. The little, there's a little metal um, sheet um, in between the, the boxes and that has um, slits in it that the bees, the worker bees and drones can walk through, uh, go up into the upper boxes or down into lower, but the holes, uh, the slots are too small for the queen to get through. So the queen can't get up into those top boxes to lay eggs. Um, so when you're, you know, setting up your hive, and usually you'll put your um, above that um, your um, the medium high body or your honey supers. That's going to be the honey that um, you're going to take um, take for yourself at the end of the season, assuming um, the hive is doing well and have enough stored up in the in the bottom deep boxes. So you don't want eggs in your honey. You don't want larvae. Um, so that queen excluder keeps them out. Um, there are people who go without using a queen excluder and the queen doesn't always go up there. Usually she'll find enough space in the bottom boxes to lay all the eggs she could possibly um, want to lay. Um, but there are times when she might may go higher and then she'll, um, you know, lay eggs up in there and, and that's okay. Um, you know, different people have different strategies. Like I said at the beginning, you ask, 10 beekeepers a question you'll get 11 different answers and um, whether to use a queen excluder or not is is one of those that's uh, up for debate i haven't had any problem using them um but you know some people say that the, either the the worker bees or the drones um, can get injured constantly going up and down through those slots um so something you can decide for yourself but I, I like using queen excluders it makes it easier for me to know when i'm doing a hive inspection that i can take those two top boxes off before i have to go looking for my queen so above those boxes is an inner cover which you can't see from here uh, um, which is basically the ceiling um, of the hive uh, it's a basically a, a solid board that has a hole in the middle and a notch uh, in the front and it just adds extra ventilation so air can go in through the bottom and come out through the top and circulate the hair, uh, the air, get moisture out. And then the outer cover, which, um, which you can see there, which basically the, the roof of the house makes, uh, um, keeps all the elements out and lets all the water or snow that's up there uh, get away from these sides and the edges. So that's a Langstroth hive. <clears throat> um, the frames that are inside the hive, um, a few different options out there for you. There are, um, so the, the, the one on the upper left is a wired wax frame. So that is basically uh, a sheet of wax that's embossed with the honeycomb uh, design and there's um, wires running vertically and horizontal to keep it straight. Um, keeping the, the whole purpose of frames is so that you have nice straight comb um, and not any, any wavy comb that's difficult to get out of the hive to, to do inspections. So the wired wax is, is, one, is one option. There's um, also um, plastic foundations, which similar have the embossed uh, hexagon on them and you can get them in a couple different colors. Um, the ones I had to, uh, available to take uh, photos of were the black and the, and the yellow. They also have one that's white. Uh, generally the black will be used for the, the bottom deeps, the brood box, um, to make it an easier back, background to be able to see eggs and larvae in the hive. And then usually the white ones will be used for the honey super so you can um, easily tell how much honey is, is in there and, and, the, and the color. And then the yellow is just kind of somewhere in the middle. 
the uh, the one on the bottom left is an all plastic frame, and that one's actually has larger uh, comb embossed on it, um, which is used for uh, um, for drones. And when we talk about pest management later, um, varroa mites, which is the biggest um, um, uh, pest um, that that we have to deal with with bees, um, tend to uh, feed on drone larvae. So you can. Um, kind of have a designated frame that'll have drones and when that's capped you can pull that out and put another one in and then you essentially kill a lot of the uh, uh, a lot of the mites. For feeder options so there's a, a few different types of feeders now but when you get a package you're, you're almost definitely going to have to feed um, at the beginning um, usually a, a sugar water either two to one um, two parts sugar to one part water or a one-to-one, -one, like a, a traditional simple syrup. Um, that's another one of those things up for debate. Some people like the one-to-one, -one, some like the two-to-one. Um, you know, it's a personal preference thing. So the, um, the options are, so the uh, one gallon bucket feeder, which is the upper right, um, basically has a little screen on the, uh, on the top, which you put underneath. Um, you tip upside down once it's full of, sh of sugar water and you put it above the inner cover and the bees will come up and drink from it. Um, the way I set it up is I put an empty box, you can see, uh, around that and then I'll put the outer cover on top of that um, just to protect it from the elements so ants or other animals aren't getting in there and, and getting the sugar water. Another option is um, on the bottom right which is a, a box of its own that has a feeder in it that you uh, put on top of your, your box. Um, that one can hold up to four gallons of, of sugar water. So if you have a, a really robust amount of bees um, and you don't wanna be out there refilling every couple days, you can put a lot in there at one time and, and they'll go uh, up through the middle, down the, the screen, get their sugar water and then bring it back down into the hive. And then the uh, easiest one is just a, a mason jar. And I've used that one for, um, for, for several different times. Um, it's just an, an easy one. I always have mason jars around and I just take a thumbtack, poke holes in, in, um, in, a, in a seal, screw it on and, and, and put that same way I would with the, uh, with the one gallon feeder, put it over the, uh, um, put it on the inner cover, surround it by another box, and then put the outer cover on it. There's also frame feeders, which I didn't have a picture of, um, which um, go actually inside of the hive um, in, in place of one of the frames. Um, and that can, those can usually hold close to a, a gallon of, uh, of sugar water as well. So other types of hives are uh, a top bar hive is a uh, is one not as popular as the Langstroth. The Langstroth is is um, certainly the most popular, um, and then there's there's derivations off of that one as well. You know the the Ware hives and and lots of different ones, but um, kind of the the top few would be the Langstroth, the top bar, which has. Um, that there's no actual frames, but there's pieces of wood inside that go um, the short way across the hive, and the bees will build out on on that and and build their frames. It's a little bit more difficult to have nice straight comb, um, so it takes a little more work at the beginning um, uh, to get it set up. Uh, but the uh, uh, but you know people who have the top bar hives really seem to like them i've never used one i've thought about it and maybe in the next year or two i'll do one just to to see what it's all about and then there's the flow hive which is just a um a, a, another take on the langstroth um, this is a, a very polarizing hive people either love them or they hate them um, the 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 basics of the hive are the same the bottom part um, the main difference is in the honey collection. So in traditional um, Langstroth hives, you'll have to either um, crush the honeycomb or put it through a honey extractor to, um, which basically spins the honey out of the hive using you know, centrifugal force. 
Um, with the flow hive, you um, basically the the honey super is fully already drawn out out of plastic, so there's no um, no wax that the bees need to um, um, to build to build up any comb in the um, in the honey super, and so they'll fill it with the nectar, dry it out, and cap it, and then the uh, once they're full, you can go in and extract straight from the from the frames. Um, I haven't used one. Um, I haven't really had the desire to use one. Um, I know, to me, it feels gimmicky, um, you know, because you still have to do all the work of, um, you know, monitoring your bees, knowing what the bees are up to. Um, it's it's kind of marketed as a, you know, you can get in there and get honey without having to do any work. You know, you don't have to open the hive. Um, which it, which really isn't the case. You still have to go in there and, and do all of your inspections, you know, every week or two. Um, but it's it's a neat idea from a um, honey collection perspective if you're only going to have one or two hives. Um, if you're going to do more than a couple hives, um, it's it's more cost prohibitive because uh, the the flow hives are probably close to twice the cost of a of a traditional Langstroth hive. And so once you get over two or three, you could get a really nice honey extractor. And, and that's one of my favorite parts is, is extracting the honey anyway. So, uh, so I don't mind the, uh, doing that in a nice, cool you know, house instead of having to do it out where it's hot out in the, out in the sun and have bees flying all around you because there's honey. So um, the image on the right just shows how that works. So it basically the the hexagon shapes um, when you turn a, a wrench, um, make it so there's a little channel and all the honey flows down the channel and out the tube at the end. So you can make hives pretty much any way you want. Um, the, the only really important part is that um, the frames are removable for inspection. Um, so that's, that's why a lot of these hive um, types have gotten very popular um, because of the ease that you can remove and inspect all of the all of the comb, all of the bees. Um, there's something called bee space, which is about three eighths of an inch gap, and that's what the bees will leave um, for moving around the hive. And so that's why a lot of these hives have very specific dimensions, and, and the frames have specific dimensions to um, create that that bee space. Um, within the hive. So if a um, if there's a space larger than three-eighths of an inch, they'll build comb um, in that space and, and use it as as part of the hive. Smaller than three-eighths, they'll they'll use propolis and and just fill up that that gap and, and seal it up tight. So I thought this was a nice picture of this is looking down through uh, in, in between two frames um, showing a, a good picture of what the bee space looks like. And this is what can happen if you don't have appropriate bee space. You can see how they'll just build extra comb. This looks like it was a uh, an inner cover um, um, based on the hole in the middle. And you can tell by the lip around the edge that it's more than three eighths of an inch and they just built um, comb on the top of that. A lot of times they'll even attach it to the frame so it'll make it that much harder to get the cover off. Um, so if you uh, if you're if you're building your own hives, you want to be very aware of that um, of the bee space because they will they'll do something like this and it'll just make a mess. And here's another example, um, more extreme example. It looks like the uh, um, this is looking up from the bottom, and there was a uh, um, a box on top of the hive that didn't have any frames in it, and so they just built comb. The way they wanted to right off of the uh, the top of the inner cover so uh, as you can see there's no way you can get in and, and inspect and see if there's any uh, disease in the hive make sure you have a, a good laying queen um, those combs are, are very difficult um, and you're not going to be able to do anything with those so when building a hive you know having the straight comb is is paramount and um and the way to do that would be using either starter strips or frames that have um, already have the plastic foundation or the uh, or the wax emboss foundation um, on there. 
So um, when we're thinking about the hive, um, another important consideration is where you're going to put your hive. Um, and I put some kind of guidelines up here that I think would um, would be helpful. You want it to be close to a source of fresh water because the bees do need to drink water. And um, the closer they are to a source of water um, versus, say, yours or your neighbor's swimming pool uh, is, is, is very important. Um, if you don't have a good fresh of, uh, source of fresh water, um, which I don't have one, I have a in-ground pool, so I don't um, have, have anything closer for them to drink from, uh, what I've done is I used a, a chicken waterer and put rocks in it um, so they have a place to land and I've put uh, a little lemongrass oil because that's um, um, something that is a, an attractant for, for the honeybees. And so a couple of drops of lemongrass oil in the, uh, in the water and um, they'll use that as, a, as their water source and, and not the swimming pool. It, as soon as that's empty, I'll know because there will be bees kind of hovering around the pool wanting to wanting to get a drink. I think it's something with the minerals in, in the water that, that they like. Um, so yeah, cl close to a fresh source of a source of fresh water is good. Um, you want to have it uh, on top of a hill or a slope um, if you have a, a, a hill. Um, you want to avoid the low-lying areas that have wet stagnant air because the moisture is really one of the bigger bigger concerns with with the bees they, they need to be able to ventilate the hive get rid of the moisture um, and if you're in a in a wet stagnant air area they're, they're just not going to do well uh, especially in, in the winter time um, if you uh, if you have open fields it's a great spot for them um, you may want to put a, a windbreak um, um, for those cold winter winds or even um, you know um, ratchet them to your stand during this uh, was it last week I think we had a pretty good amount of wind um, here in central mass and um, one of my hives the uh, outer cover actually um, got lifted up and 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 um, was was twisted on the hive so I had to go back out and, and settle it back in so yeah um, a windbreak is good um, if you if you can't have a windbreak ratchet straps and, and, and ratchet it together um, it would be recommended. Also, you want your entrance facing east or to the southeast. Um, the idea is there that they can get the early morning sun because um, that'll kind of wake them up, get them out foraging, um, kind of get an early start on the day. If, they're, if they don't get that early morning sun, they'll be, you know, they're not going to be the first ones out there. They're not going to be the most productive. Um, so east southeast is ideal you also want to leave a space behind the hives um, you don't want to put them right up against a, a, a fence um, like i did my first year um, so you want it because you want to be able to um, get in and do your hive inspections from behind the hive so you're not blocking the entrance um, they won't sting you but they might be flying towards the hive and either bump into you or just kind of hover behind you and then you'll turn around and you'll have you know a thousand bees just waiting to get into the hive so um, leave a few feet behind your hive so you can you can get at them and, and work them from from the backside. Uh, you also want to elevate your hive off the ground you don't want to have it um, flat on the ground um, uh, a lot of times people will do that with you know cinder blocks and some you know, four by four posts. It, it doesn't have to be very high, you know, a foot to 18 inches off the ground is, is usually sufficient. And really what that does is it helps um, from a predator point of view, um, you know, things like skunks that really like to eat bees. Um, if it's on the ground, the, the bees can't really sting through their fur, but if it's elevated, the, the, um, the skunks have to get up on their hind legs and then their bellies exposed and that's a um a place where the bees can get in and sting and um and you know kind of r run the the predators off so off the ground a little bit um is, is a good thing <clears throat> so this is a uh a picture i actually had the um 
the beekeeping club from Clark university come out to my, um, uh, to the hives that I have, um, at my home. And, um, I put this picture in cause it showed a couple of things. One, you can see I left some, uh, after my first year, I, I pulled the hives away from the fence a little so we can actually get behind the hives to, uh, to do our inspections. Um, um, you can see what the inner cover looks like on the, the third hive over because we have the top, um, the outer cover off. So you can see there's a, might be a little hard to see, but there's a little notch on the front and then there's a hole in the middle for, for ventilation. And then you can see the, um, um, the, the bee suit preferences. So I'm, uh, I'm wearing my jacket in this one. I'm on, I'm all the way on the right. But the beekeeping club just has the uh, the veil to cover their their face and the gloves, and then and that's it. So, you know, they were comfortable. Um, and some of them had this was their first time actually getting into a hive. Um, the the Clark University beekeeping club I think has I don't know, 20, 25 members, but they only have two hives. So uh, they were looking for somebody to um, to you know mentor them and and. Um, give them some hands-on experience because not everybody could go in and do their inspections and 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 actually open up hives. So uh, invited them out, and you could see the uh, they were fine with just the veil and gloves. Um, you know, maybe one or two stings, and they came six or seven weeks um, on the weekends. Um, you can also in this picture see what I use for a hive stand, um, the cinder blocks. And a couple four by four posts, and you can fit four uh, four hives on that. Those are just eight foot uh, four by fours. And uh, yeah, I think that was the 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 main points I want to make about this one here. You can also see how close my hives are to the neighbor if you look over the fence. Um, and the um, the nice thing about how bees will uh, fly is they like to go up straight up to the elevation they need to, then they'll go across to wherever the plants are that they are going to forage from. And then they'll go kind of spiral straight down to those plants. So by having this fence here, you're not going to have bees at kind of flying um, past you at, at, at eye level. They're going to be above the fence. So they're going to be, there's going to be like a bee super highway. Um, you know, maybe 10, 12 feet up in the air, um, which if there was no, uh, no fence there, um, th that might not be the case. So yeah, the, the neighbors rarely notice the bees because of the, the flight patterns and because of the, uh, uh, the fence that they tend to fly overhead. Um, you can hear the buzzing through the fence, you know, so if they're, they're on the other side of the fence, you can hear them pretty good, but, um, yeah, they're not, they're not bumping into you or anything like that. And that, so that's everything I have for this. Um, feel free to send any questions over through the, uh, through the chat um, that you may have. This is a, kind of a, a, a fun one, but you know, difficult as well, because you know, of all the different kinds of hives there are that I didn't have pictures of. And um, you know, at least the, for last week's class, I was able to get some good pictures that I had uh, um, taken over the over the years to have good examples to show you, but uh, decided to start the course in the middle of winter when I couldn't go out to to the hives and, and take a lot of pictures. But um, hopefully this was helpful, and um, I'll pause for a minute here, take a quick drink of water, and see if there's any questions. All right, doesn't look like there's any questions. So um, if you guys are um, considering buying your hive or have any questions about what type of hive or what kind of equipment, um, let me know. There are, you know, um, you know, some bee suppliers out there that will have uh, deals on, you know, hive tools. Say, you know, if you buy one, they're six bucks. If you get 10 or more, it's five bucks, something like that. Um, so, you know, we want to try to, uh, well, there's only eight people here now, but there are 40 people signed up for the, uh, the course. So we'll, if, if there's enough interest, we should, um, certainly, um, consider doing a, a group purchase and, 
um, you know, save on shipping and, and save a little bit of money that way. All right. Oh, so we have a question here. Uh, what should I feed my hives right now? So if you have hives that are making it through winter, um, you wouldn't want to feed any liquid um, because the, the moisture will be uh, an issue and, um, and the, the, the cold is, is not good. So the, um, um, I would feed either uh, just granulated sugar, um, which is what I have. So I, I put newspaper down on top of the, um, the top uh, deep box and I put maybe two or three pounds of sugar um, on, a, on that sheet of newspaper and the bees will, if they eat through all of their honey stores, because they'll start lower in the hive and then work their way up, eating their way to the top of the hive. So if they make it all the way to the top, I, I put some, you know, just, just regular granulated sugar um, on the top. I actually might even have a, a photo here. Let's see if I can. Okay, so while that's pulling up, there was a, another question. Hi, I missed the first 10 minutes. Is there a way of watching again? Um, yeah, so I'm actually recording this, um, this session and I will, um, um, I'll save the video and I'll, I'll probably just make a YouTube link and I can send that out um, to you afterwards. Okay, so here's an image of what, uh, this was actually just uh, today. So I went out and, because it was warm enough, I went out and checked. And you can see they're starting to eat through some of the sugar. And you can see around the edge, you can see a little bit of the newspaper. Um, so they're, they're doing well. Um, but yeah, basically just newspaper and, and sugar. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Okay, so another question came in about livestock. What's the best uh, placement for hives? Um, so they might go for the um, the water troughs. Um, I know from a so I have some hives at a um, at a, a dairy farm, and basically what they did is they used um, the electric fence around. Um, basically, they just kind of made a notch in their electric fence for me to put hives and and extended it um, into that area because um, you know the, the cows they'll just rub up rub up against everything and they would knock the hives over in no time. Um, so the um, yeah, the, the waterers, they might get near, they won't really bother, um, the, the bees won't bother the livestock um, unless they're, you know, bumping up against the hives themselves. Um, but yeah, they, they may go for the water. Okay, next question is, is it normal to see a huge amount of dead bees around the hive in the winter? Um, I do have insulation around the hive. So um, yeah, especially if you have a nice warm day, the bees will, um, basically do some house cleaning and they'll bring they'll literally carry out the dead bees and usually they'll fly pretty far away but in cold weather their wings don't work very well um, so they'll they'll just bring them out and they'll just dump them out of the hive um, I mean I guess I, I don't know what a huge amount is but I would say you know maybe a hundred to two hundred bees um, would be would be normal to to see um, a lot of times if your hive dies, they're not all going to be out and on the ground. They're either going to be on the bottom board or have, if they, you know, if they starve, their heads would be in the cells of, uh, uh, of the honeycomb. So yeah, the dead bees around the hive, and it's more noticeable too on the white snow. All right. So it doesn't look like there's any other questions. So with that, we'll end the meeting and I will, um, like I say, I'll, I'll save the, the recording and um, put it online and um, I'll save this chat as well so I know who to send to and we'll be, uh, we'll be good to go. So we'll, we'll, next week we'll talk about the, um, uh, I think it was the first week, what to expect um, and kind of walk through every step of the way. Um, and we'll go from there. Uh, the class two weeks from now, um, I may need to cancel. I might be out of town and um, I would be out of the country. So certainly doing it remotely like I was going to try to do from Disney won't work. But uh, I'll, I'll know more probably uh, at next week's class.
All right. So with that, we'll end the meeting. We'll see you guys next week. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.